Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for joining us on this weekly series of podcasts. Today, we are lucky enough to have Lynn Marie Ozine join us. She is the CMO at Beneficial State Bank. Lynn Marie, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Boris. Lynn Marie, thank you very much for joining us on the show uh, today. Lynn Marie, you and I have had the pleasure of working together in the past, but to all of our listeners and viewers today, would you mind giving a little bit of an intro of how you ended up in the financial services industry? Sure. This was, I don't want to date myself too much, but it was the early 90s. And um, I was in the process of applying to medical school. And um, my boyfriend at the time was buying his first home. He had gotten a good job. And I was sitting at the table with him and this mortgage broker. And uh, this guy couldn't answer half of our questions. And <laughs> he was trying to uh, sell us a mortgage that was not really competitive in the marketplace. And I realized he was trying to take advantage of our ignorance. And so I, he pulled out his HP calculator and I pulled out mine and we went to war with each other. And I ended up uh, demonstrating to him that the mortgage I was asking for was a better deal than the one he was recommending. And that's when I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this for the next year and make some money for business school or actually for medical school. Uh -huh. And um, what ended up happening is I just never got out of it. I loved it so much. I love seeing people buy their first home. Uh -huh. I love people like seeing what was possible for their lives and getting to know them and their families. And I'm still friends with so many of those people that I helped, you know, purchase their first home. And after a few years of that, I thought, you know what, I shouldn't go to medical school. I should go to business school. I think I want to stay in finance. And I think I want to continue to empower people using the financial services system. That's great. That's awesome. And here you are, Chief Marketing right. Officer at Beneficial State Bank. Yes. Yeah. Lynn Marie, we've got an exciting topic to talk about the mission statement of the bank and the unique position you're in to be leading this charge. Now, a lot of folks, a lot of listeners are probably not familiar with Beneficial State Bank. I know that really it's a banking or bank on purpose is sort of the tagline or the mission statement of the bank. But what does that actually mean? Can you help our viewers sort of understand that better? Sure. So uh, we were created on the foundation that banks should serve people and not the other way around. So rather than being primarily focused on generating a profit, we uh, were founded in, under a, a unique ownership structure and we're focused on a triple bottom line, a pure triple bottom line where profit does not exceed our goals of environmental sustainability and social equity. And so that, that permeates you know, our, our lending practices, our communications, our governance, every aspect of the, the organization. That's great. And, and so, as you say that, that makes t total and absolute sense, right? That the bank is looking out for the people that it does business with. It, it doesn't seem like too novel of a concept, but what, like, let's, if we go down a little bit of a deeper level, what makes Beneficial State Bank uh, like so different? Because that's obviously a very differentiated statement, if you will, that, that you're making about it. Right. Well, when you think about almost any bank and even most credit unions, you have shareholders or stakeholders. And their primary hope and directive or expectation after investing in you is that they are going to make a profit. Mm -hmm. They want to see you grow. They want to see right. them grow. And other things are nice, you know, doing great things in the community or planting some trees or <laughs> you know, maybe resisting the temptation to finance private prisons. That's wonderful. That's great that you're doing that makes me feel good, but I want to maximize the return on my money. And if you mm -hmm. can't do that, I'll take my money out and I'll put it somewhere else. So uh, the founders of the bank, recognized that, you know, that's Milton Friedman's adage, right? That um, corporations exist to serve and maximize profit on behalf of the shareholders. So they said, well, how do we change that? How do we flip it around so that there are no shareholders 
demanding that we maximize profit. So when they created the bank, they took all of the economic equity and they donated it to a nonprofit foundation that can only be uh, represented and have a board of directors appointed by nonprofits that represent our mission principles around the environment, social equity, and community. And so we are 100% owned by nonprofit entities that are aligned with our mission. Their objective is not to maximize profit. Their objective is to deliver the greatest good for the greatest number of people within and across our community. Got it. But like, if we think about that, you're owned by nonprofits, but you're still a for-profit institution, right? Did I, did I get that correct? Yes, that's a tricky one. <laughs> And there's yeah. a reason for that. Yeah, please. Yeah, so our other primary objective is that we don't want to just prove that we're better than mm. everybody else. We want to prove a new model for banking. And right. then we want to share that model with others. And then we want to scale it. And there are a lot of banks and credit out, unions out there that are not in a position to say, oh, well, we can just stop maximizing profits. They need a transition. They need a path from good to great. And so we're trying to be that model and prove that model. And the foundation that oversees us is also responsible for one of our mission principles around radical transparency. So that isn't just transparency around our numbers and our performance, it's transparency around our strategies. It's transparency around our failures and mm. our policies and our compensation at every level. And so we want to prove this model and then hand it out to other banks and credit unions that want to adopt it. But in order to do that, you also still have to operate in the real world, right? right. You have to sort of bridge that gap between only for profit growth at all cost business and a pure nonprofit. There's got to be some happy medium in there that still balances profit with social equity and the environment. And so that's what we're trying to prove and that's what we're trying to scale. Yeah, it's interesting. And I know we, we had an earlier conversation a little bit uh, about this and we were saying, okay, well, look, if the bank is for, for profit um, and it's their design to make money, but then at the same time, you're trying to achieve a radical level of tran transparency, you know, how do we, how do we do that? Or how do you guys do that at Beneficial State Bank? Because you know, everybody hates fees. Everybody still doesn't like this notion of paying interest, but those are the, uh, if you will, the vehicles of how financial mm -hmm. institutions make, make money. So what is, uh, what is different or how are you trying to balance that uh, a bit differently, if you will? Right. Well, uh, we do need to charge fees and yes. we need to charge interest on our loans to cover our costs because at the end we are, the oldest, most traditional form of crowdfunding. Yeah. So the people that we have a fiduciary responsibility to are our depositors and we need to return income and interest to them still, just like every credit union and bank needs to. So in order to accomplish that, we do need to generate re revenue so that they can earn a reasonable and fair interest rate on their deposit. But since we don't need to maximize profit, we're not looking to grow unchecked you know we've decided that there's a limit we want to optimize mm. our profits so whenever our profits exceed our threshold which is around 12 percent roe right now mm -hmm. we take that money and it goes up to the foundations that own equity interest in us and gets redistributed to the communities we serve got it that way there's no incentive for us to maximize profit in fact, as we see ourselves approaching that upper threshold, that's our key, our alarm, our opportunity to look at our pricing and see, can we be more generous with our depositor? Mm -hmm. Can we reduce fees somewhere? Got and it. that's our commitment from the get-go, of course. You know, we want to find efficiencies of scale and scope from the beginning so that we can fulfill on that earlier. But, you know, if we accidentally go over that 12%, it, it's not a bad thing, right? Got that it. money's still going back to our community. Got it. You know, you mentioned an interesting thing. I, I love that little blip that you said. We're the oldest form of crowdfunding. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure that a lot of people think about financial institutions uh, being being that. Perhaps they need a marketer like yourself to help them uh, better better shape that that narrative. 
Now, I do want to pick up on, a, on, a, on an interesting point that you made right when you were talking about other banks and credit unions and how you're developing a new model. One may say that this is a competitive model or is this a collaborative model? Maybe it's a competitive model, but help, help me out here. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Boris. Um, I would say the short answer is that we don't want to compete. Uh, particularly, mm. well, I'll say specifically with small community banks and credit unions, okay. because we do advocate for smaller banks. And okay. when you look at the consolidation that's gone on in the banking industry. Yeah, it's been tremendous. Yeah. In 94, what was it? Like small to medium banks that were under 10 billion in assets. That was 50% of the banks that were out there. That's and right. the giant banks that are over 100 billion, that was less than 20% of the banks. Right. And then I think last year's statistics were that 50% has shrunk to 16%. Yeah. And that 16% has grown to 59%. So you've got some very, a handful of mega banks that are really not just controlling the entire industry, but they are wagging the dog. Yeah. That they are manipulating regulations in their favor, like with the dismantling of Glass-Steagall, which mm -hmm. some would say contributed to our Great Recession. So when we think about, you know, how do you create accountability for serving the people who are or should be your primary stakeholders? I think community banks, smaller regional banks, and credit unions are already in that space. And the last thing we want to do is compete with each other. In fact, maybe that's our opportunities to collaborate. Because I think a lot of people, when you look at the behavioral science, they, they're attracted to larger banks because mm -hmm. financial services is complicated and it's right. scary and intimidating. And if you're, here's this big bank that's familiar and a lot of people bank there, so it must be safe. But if right. community banks and credit unions joined forces and we started delivering the same message and helping people wake up to the possibility that, you know, it's maybe safer and more in your interest in the interest of your community to bank small and bank local. And maybe if you bank small, you can make a big impact. Yeah. And, and perhaps, you know, I don't know if somebody is publishing already a playbook of collaboration, but the, my next follow-up question was really around, well, how, how will Beneficial State Bank collaborate with other um, local banks or other credit unions? I think everybody has that idea. You know, we attend lots of conferences. We host lots of speakers mm -hmm. like yourself that talk a lot about collaboration. And I know there is, whether it's uh, CUNA organizations or other uh, like CBA type organizations that foster that, but clearly clearly the numbers would actually indicate, well, the numbers indicate contraction. That, that, that's just very factual. So whatever collaborative story we're talking about today isn't quite working. Uh, right. There's got to be a different way, right? There's always a different way. Yeah. And um, I, I won't claim that we know the best way. We're experimenting. And yeah. it would be great if we could all experiment together. I think that collective wisdom across community banks and credit unions is so, it's invaluable. Yeah. Uh, but we belong to a lot of the traditional organizations for banks like Western and American Bankers Association. Right. But we also have signed on to the Paris Climate Accord and um, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. And we're not just a community development financial institution, we're one of the 7% of CDFIs that is ranked as outstanding. So that is a community. It's a community of like-minded organizations that are already partway down the path to being looking at their governance and their lending and their business structures and saying, how can we make this as fair and productive and benevolent and um, impactful as possible? And we, we want to collaborate with them because when you have a group of people who are values aligned investors, they need a bank. When you have a bunch of people who are banking with you because they, your bank aligns with their values, they're going to be more, you know, prosperous and then they're going to need an investment manager. So we need those uh, small community synergies based on values alignment. That makes, that makes sense. 
You know, the only the thing that I always also think a, a little bit about is, you know, this for you is a differentiator, largely just because not many people, fortunately or unfortunately, think uh, from a banking perspective exactly the way that you think about that today. Because, you know, one of the things that we already know is that rates are like commodities these, these days, right? I mean, it, it's largely a commodity, uh, you know, whether you're, you get your mortgage rate here, there, you know, obviously this is a, differenti a substantial differentiator for you, for like-minded people. But I think um, we always talk about, you know, also great service. And that also means very different things to many different banks and financial institutions. What I love to hear is how different is that at beneficial state? What does that actually mean within your organization? That's an interesting question because I'll say, I will admit, you know, when I joined this bank, we're a product of a consolidation of other, in some ways, vision, mission, and values aligned banks. So mm -hmm. we screwed over a billion dollars, not organically over the last 12 years, somewhat organically, but mostly through acquisition and consolidation. And it is really hard to deliver world-class service, much less competitive products and pricing mm -hmm. when you're in the midst of a, like a triple merger integration, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a little challenging. And um, so, you know, we thought we could hire pricey consultants to help us with our customer centric values models and refine our campaigns. And, um, but if you don't have the right people equipped with the right tools and empower them with good judgment when it matters most, you're going to fall flat every time. And so I guess for me, service is not about product or price or process or training. It's about culture at the end of the day. Yeah. It's about like you look at Zappos. If you are unhappy with an experience, that person, that CSR or customer service rep, and there's another meaning for that acronym we could talk about later, but that CSR is empowered. They know that they're in a servant leadership organization where the leader's responsibility is to support them so that they can deliver a great experience. You know, the corporate hierarchy is flipped around and the leader's on the bottom and the people who serve the customer are on the top. And if you can do that, if you can empower those people to use their best judgment and say, you know what, Boris isn't happy with those boots that got delivered two weeks late. Here's a hundred dollar credit. We're so sorry. And that person is not only empowered, but they are happy. They're honored to make that concession to you. And they have a stake in the effectiveness and long-term success of that business. They are committed. And I think when you shift to that, when you can shift to that model, then you naturally get great service. Of course, there's going to be an infrastructure, a technology, a policy, and a leadership element to all of that. So not to say that culture compensates or eliminates the dependency on all of those variables. But I, I will say, like when we entered into um, the COVID-19, the pandemic period, mm -hmm. yep. and then the government came out with um, their PPP program, the mm -hmm. Paycheck program under the CARES right. Act. We're a licensed SBA lender, but we weren't doing a lot of SBA loans because they're so labor intensive and so complex that a lot of our clients were just like, oh, give us a conventional business loan. This is too much work. We can't navigate the underwriting. But when PPP came out, you know, we went from doing maybe 10 commercial loans a month and about 100 to 120 a year to uh, I think in the first three weeks of the PPP program, we had so many requests flood in from clients and non-clients that we did a thousand loans. Wow. Three weeks. We did like, I want to say seven or eight years of business in a few weeks. Not that those loans are going to generate a huge profit for us. Right. In fact, the wonderful thing was nobody ever stopped to say how much money are we going to make? Yeah. everyone's concern, everybody came together, they dropped everything they were doing, our retail bankers, our relationship managers, our treasury managers, our auto lending business, everybody dropped everything they were doing and said, how can we help? And it brought us together as a bank. And we said our primary objective is to get a paycheck into the hands of the employees of all of these, these 1,000, actually it's 2,000 small businesses that had reached out to us. And, you know, when you see that happen, 
then you know you have a strong culture and you know you're service oriented. And in the, that three week period, we made loyal clients for life. And yeah. so it's just an example of that if you do come together. And also we had to implement some technology solutions very rapidly in order to support, you know, increasing our volume by a factor. What is that? A? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting concept that you talk about, which is largely around empowering the agent, making sure that they have the right tools. And then th that really leads to providing, um, you know, great customer service. I mean, we think a little bit, a little bit of that, you know, we see a lot of similarities between whether it's the financial services sector or, or other verticals doing, doing that. It, it's, it's kind of interesting why we haven't been on a, on a much faster shift to, to, to adopt that. Um, I don't know any insight. Why any thoughts on that, on that particular, particular topic, what's holding us back, if you will. Yeah, I, I think the same thing that's holding us back from being trim and tone and having the perfect body is that, <laughs> you know, you can know how to do it, eat yeah. salads and exercise, but knowing that you need to do these things and actually executing on them is much more complicated. And I think that's, that's true in organizations. And also, um, there's a lot of fear in organizations. Oh. So individuals are so worried about keeping their job and the person competing who wants their job and the person that they're managing who's trying to undermine them because they want to be promoted or don't like the way that they're being managed and then the person that you're reporting up to judging you and fearing that you know if I don't deliver for that next quarter then maybe my job is in jeopardy and when you create that kind of instability and fear it's sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs you can't say let's think about how I build psychological safety for everyone I work with and create this sort of kumbaya environment where we're all just focused on the most optimal outcome for, you know, our communities. It's really hard to make that leap and that transition and leadership will hire, you know, very expensive consultants, which my leadership did in the last couple very large banks that I was a part of. Um, and those, consultants charge just a lot of money to tell us here's exactly what you need to do and here's your little roadmap good luck let us know how it goes that's right and um it that really went nowhere got it and but how do how do we how do we get past this fear this fear of being comfortable how do we uh move out of the fear-based culture so that we can get out of our own way and deliver great service yeah, that, that's a, a good question. And I don't have the perfect answer, but I have an opinion. Yeah, and love I, to hear it. I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> so, um, I'm always looking for what's like the path of least resistance. And for me to, to flip a culture or to build a culture, that's mm -hmm. one of empowerment, psychological safety, and very service oriented. I think you need three things. You need that to be a top-down directive. Even if it's a servant leadership model, you need a model, a visionary leader at the top that is unequivocally, unapologetically committed to supporting and empowering their employee base and serving their communities, like with passion and heart and vulnerability. Second, you need to build the organization around that. Your incentive programs need to reward and recognize that. Your analytics need to measure customer satisfaction, engagement, and loyalty first and foremost, not expenses and profit and products and share of wallet and how many products does somebody have, you know, like we, right. we know where that can take you. Um, and then third, once you build it, you have to maintain it. A lot of people put a lot of work into building out their values, you know, here are beautiful values. And then they put it up on the wall, like a cat poster. It's really useful, right? Well, you need to operationalize and activate those values on an ongoing basis and make it everyone's responsibility across the organization to be the stewards of those missions and those values. And if you can crowdsource them from your employees so that everybody has a sense of ownership over that okay. mission and those values and just never let your team and your people, your leadership ever get complacent because the moment you do, you're going to backslide because we are climbing up a slippery hill when you're building strong culture. And it, every time you stop climbing, you slide back. 
Well, that's, that's that's great insight. I mean, there's uh, so much wealth that I think our listeners could take take uh, take away from that. And I think that that really, I think where we started this conversation, which was largely around um, the purpose that the bank has and mm-hmm. sort of those principles and how you can sort of interweave them into great service and ensure that. I mean, I think your comment makes total sense because if those principles are not continuing to be um, I'll call it like documented and being talked about and being reinforced, then people slowly as time progresses continue to move away from them, whether that's, you know, banking on purpose or whether that's delivering great service. I think, I think your message resonates really, really well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're at the top of our hour. Lynn Marie, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the show and giving this, uh, this level of insight to, our listeners today. Thank you very much. It sounds like better things yet to come for Beneficial State Bank. I'm excited to see this venture play out and hopefully more and more people align with this model. Thank you again. Thanks, Boris. Absolutely.